wondering if there's anybody in here saved enough to admit that God will supply. <laughs> Somebody want to know how you know that? Because I'm already here. My presence is proof that He will supply all of my needs. Praise the Lord, everybody. Y'all know we're not here for a week or a funeral, right? We come to see God do something awesome. Amen. a little weighted down from your meal. Some of you might be a little weary from the day. But is there anybody who can give God 30 seconds of praise? Just for being saved. Just for being delivered. Hallelujah. Yeah. comes a fresh attack not just on him but on his family I just need to know are there any prayer warriors in there? you don't have to be on the program your name don't have to be written on the program but you got enough power where you can say in the name of Jesus his presence in this place to Pastor Thomas we thank you so much for the invitation God bless you to all of my co-laborers in the gospel ministry uh, we thank God for you certainly to Lady Thomas God bless you thank you so much for that introduction to all of the officers of both churches certainly to our honoree this afternoon and to our first lady amen first lady Latasha Wilson and we give God praise for her As I entered the church, I, I thought about when I was ordained as a deacon here. I was thinking, I said, man, I was 22 years old. Thought I had it made. This was it. God don't ask me for nothing else. I just want to let you know, God has so much more in store for you than this day. But this day is important in your life. And so we pray that we can be a blessing as we share in this moment. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 6. And then we're going to flip over to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 6. And then we're going to flip over to Acts chapter 8. Oh yeah. Acts chapter 6 and then... Acts chapter 8. If you're physically able to stand, please stand in reverence to the word of God. His word is so powerful that when you yield to it, when it hits you, it'll knock you down. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Acts chapter 6, beginning at verse 2. It says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Go down to verse 7. Verse 7 says, And the word of God increased. 
the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Let's go on over to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, we want to pick it up at verse 5. It says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And verse 8 says, And there was great joy in that city. I want to preach about the power of the deacon. All right. All right. The power. All right. The power of the deacon. Hallelujah. My sisters and brothers, one of the greatest challenges for the church in the 21st century is how to maintain its relevance. In essence, how to meet the needs of a changing congregation in a changing society. Especially when the expectations of those in need often get sidetracked by the demands of this chaotic world we live in. The church is facing this kind of challenge today. During the time of Christ, Jesus told us that the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. We see this more and more every day, don't we? The 21st century church is a witness to this great dynamic. Pastors are forced to grapple with finding a balance between the church of our parents and the church of our children. Teaching a love for the diversity between those who love hymns and those who desire worship songs. Trying to find a way to distinguish common ground between those who love being in church all day from those who will only give you an hour of their time. Facing the fact that there are givers or takers, committed or lukewarm, those who have a zeal of God but oftentimes not according to knowledge. We have no choice but to face this harsh and oftentimes unfair reality. And while ministry spins and turns in search of answers to this new paradigm, there remains a need for the people of God to be cared for. Needs that exceed past the Sunday morning experience. I'm talking about them Monday through Saturday needs. Believe it or not, there are saints inside the sanctuary, some sitting on your pew, right, who don't know how they're going to get food this week. Right, there are folk who have been in church just as long as you have and still don't know how to pray. Right. There's somebody who doesn't know how in the world in just a few short days, in just a week, they're going to pay their rent. They don't know how to find direction. And believe it or not, there are folks who shout loud but still on the inside have no hope. Yeah. This isn't new to believers. In fact, this is what sparked the calling and consecrating of the diaconate early in the first century church. Yeah. This is where we find ourselves in the sixth chapter of the book of Acts. The first century church was filled with great excitement. You have to understand, Jesus has been resurrected. He has given the church its commission and its charge. And early in their existence, they had tremendous experience. The apostles, filled with the presence and power of the Holy Ghost, were preaching and teaching the word at a feverish pace. People were giving their lives over to the Lord. They were turning over to Christ. They were becoming saved. They started following the new teaching that, that started with this great itinerant preacher named Jesus. And while the religious establishment thought that it was over, while the religious establishment thought that Jesus, his message would die with him on the cross, what they didn't understand is when he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me, that his death and resurrection would spark an explosion and a revival in the community where people started coming to him. See, the gospel of Jesus was refreshing and gave the people some hope. It gave the people joy. It gave the people peace, knowing that God welcomed relationship, not religion. Knowing that God would wash them from their sins and that they could be saved by faith and not by works or some sacrifice. 
Christ that their old religion demanded that they perform in order to be known, seen, or even recognized. But anytime there is large growth, anytime there is an explosion of growth among church, we find that there's going to be some stirring among the people. The Greek-speaking widows began to complain that they were not receiving the help that they needed. And that the Hebrew speaking widows were receiving more help than they. I don't care if it's the first century or 21st century. Anytime somebody get one slice more bread than the next person, somebody going to have something to say. It doesn't seem like it would have been that way, but it was. They began to complain that the Hebrew speaking widows are getting more from the, from the, from the handouts of the church. They're getting more attention. They're getting more grain. They're getting more food. And, and we're being ignored. We are being neglected and the apostles had to leave the preaching and teaching of the word to handle these little fires that were springing up in the first century church. So they call the church meeting and after they call the church meeting, they decide that in order to address this, that they would establish a group of seven men to handle the business of serving tables. <laughs> The requirements were simple. They would be men who are well respected. They had to be of honest report. And they couldn't be, you know, little Willie on the corner. It couldn't be, you know, it couldn't be a rooster, the whoremonger down, down the street. It, it just couldn't be some thief who just walked up, just got out of jail. Now all of a sudden he want to be something like we do today. You know, it, no, it had to be somebody of substance who had respect in the community. They had to be full of the Holy Ghost. They, you know, they couldn't just be the kind of person who sat there like a bump on a log and didn't feel nothing, didn't know nothing, couldn't say nothing, couldn't do nothing under the unction of the Holy Spirit. They had to be full of wisdom to be appointed over this specific work. And the Bible shares that the people were pleased with this solution. Seven men were selected, prayed over, and consecrated for this service. And the Bible says in verse 7 that something major happened when the deacons started working. The Bible says that the first thing that happened is that the word of God increased. It increased because the apostles didn't have to leave the preaching and teaching of the word to handle problems among people. Not only did the word of God increase, but it says that the number of disciples multiplied. This right here shows us, I can park for a moment, this shows us that one of the reasons the church has hit a dead end with growing is because we have to take too much time away from the word of God in order to address fires among the people. That's why we need the power of the deacons to come back in the place large number of the priests who were loyal to their Jewish faith started becoming converted saying there's something about this faith that we want to be a part of yes, during the early days of the church change occurred and the deacons were effective they were instrumental in making this happen, even though the church was trying to figure out how to maintain its relevance after the resurrection of Jesus, even though they weren't experienced or sure of how to meet the needs of a changing congregation in a changing society, even though they were under the threat of persecution and arrest. God was free to move. He was free to save. He was free to heal. He was free to deliver because of the power of the deacon. I come by to tell you this afternoon when God calls us into his service, this is the kind of result we look to produce. We look to not just take a position and not have any impact after we get there. We don't just look to have a tag and a title and then there is no effect of our presence yes, yes. after we have shown up. As right, a matter right. of fact, every believer ought to make up in their mind that because you love God and you are obedient to Him, when you show up, there's going to be a difference. When right. you yes, attend, yes, there's going to yes. be an impact. Because all we need to do is follow what the Lord says and He'll do the rest. Yes, yes. It all, all it took to settle this issue was to make room for the Word was several men were selected and the word spread. Seven men were chosen and the disciples multiplied. Seven men 
handled the little problems of the church in the first century and all of a sudden priests who followed their Jewish heritage all their lives start turning around and becoming Christians. Yeah. Somehow this ministry has lost track of its history. Mm. We often hear the horror stories of devilish deacons, men who try to control the pastor, hoarding over power and positions, people who want a spot or a title but won't pray, people who, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said they won't pray, some of them can't pray, because what they offer up ain't a prayer, they having a conversation with their buddy, they not having a conversation with God. Because if you don't know how to pray yet, then that means you ain't got no business being a deacon. Men who won't attend Bible study, they aren't even familiar with what time Sunday school is held, won't visit the sick, won't feed the hungry, or even serve the membership. We have lost track of it in this generation. People who think that the only responsibility of the deacon is to sit their fat behind on the front row and cross their legs and criticize everything that everybody else does. That is not the role of the deacon, and I dare say it has power, but not the right kind of power. It's got devilish power. It's got hell-raising power, but that's not what we need in our churches today. We need some men who can get a prayer through. We need some men who can love with all their heart. We need some men who understand, if I got to do this by myself, I'll do it by myself. There's more to being a deacon than serving communion. That's right. There's more to being a deacon than wearing a black suit and having white gloves on first Sunday. There's more to being a deacon than putting water in a swimming pool. No, you've got to have a spiritual discernment and a connection that gives you the kind of power to say, Pastor, I got it. You just keep preaching the word. Pastor, I got it. You keep teaching because we need the word to increase and the disciples to multiply. My 20 years of pastoring, visiting churches and preaching here and there, I've run across some characters well. under the title of deacon. I run across some deacons who couldn't spell deacon. Some who were mean, cantankerous. Some who didn't have the heart of the pastor. That's right. Some who didn't have the best interest of the church. All they cared about was themselves. All they cared about was their position. All they cared about was where they was going to sit. All they cared about was who was going to recognize them. And they had no power. They had a power. Power of the devil. But they didn't have the power of the Holy Ghost. If ministry is going to get back on track. The people and duties God has established in scripture must be maintained in practice. These standards are serious, church. Yeah. And Deacon McFadden, I want you to know they make a difference, especially for this season of ministry. That's why Paul linked the qualifications of the deacon to that of the preacher, because together they can do some damage to Satan's kingdom. Paul said when the deacon lines up like the preacher... And they both are walking in respect or grave, as the scripture says. And they walk with dignity, not giggling and laughing with everybody and running around playing games. But instead, always have their eye on the congregation looking for the need of the people. When they have that discerning spirit that something needs to be handled, they don't have to pick up the phone and call the next deacon to call the next deacon to call the next deacon to find out what you want us going to do. They already know what needs to be done. They got to be sincere about this thing. Because it's not about me, it's about the Lord. They can't be double-tongued, can't be drunkards. You can't be a deacon and you hiding out at Mercedes and Mates on Saturday night. Now you want to come sliding in church on Sunday morning telling people what to do with your liquor breath. No, you got to have some seriousness about you. They have to have an understanding of the mysteries of the gospel. That's right. Know your word. How horrible it is to go to a deacon and ask them something about the Bible and they don't know what you're talking about. They know church protocol, but they don't know the word. You gotta be tested in their faith, not guilty of scandal. And their wives should be helpers. 
Not busybodies, not those who run their mouths, not those who are trying to run their husbands. You got to be the husband of one wife. The husband of one wife, no girlfriends on the side, and in this season, no boyfriends either. It may be all right with America, but it ain't all right with God. I'm, I'm sorry, I just got to put it out that way. Now, you might want to wink and blink at a guy if you want to. It's all right with America. You'll be all right in America, but you're going to bust hell wide open when you get to dealing with God. You can show your passport if you want to. That's going to burn right with you. Paul said you got to be a good parent. You got to rule your house well. You got you to know how to take care of your, your, your business. Because you can't take care of the church business and your car being repossessed. And you sure enough can't stand in front of the church and ask nobody to give no money and you ain't put none in. You stand in front of the church talking about we raising funds for this and you gonna reach in your pocket, turn around so can't nobody see you pull a dollar out. No. This position is too serious for that. These are serious times. And they call for serious people to serve God. And although many people look at this as some glamorous position, it's not. The word of God has revealed that while they experienced success in ministry, there was also a time of struggle. And this is what made the role of the deacon so important to ministry. You see, after their success in Jerusalem, the Jews increased their pressure to stop the church. The Bible says that Saul, this Pharisee, who later on would be changed to Paul, he rose up with other Pharisees with the intention of terminating the Christians. Yes. Stephen, one of the original seven, began preaching one Sunday afternoon and they stoned him to death because of his testimony. The persecution was fierce and many had to flee to stay alive. One of those was Deacon Philip. And of all the places in the world to go to, Deacon Philip goes to Samaria. He goes to the place where the Jews were hated. He goes to the place where there was racial tensions. He goes to the place where they clearly did not like each other. And scripture teaches us that when he arrived, he opened his mouth and preached Christ unto them. He didn't go down there with preconceived ideas. He didn't go down there with his head hung low. He didn't go down there with his tail stuck between his legs because they were being chased by the Pharisees. He said, if I can't do it in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I'll go to Samaria. And he went down there and opened his mouth. Now, Greater Cornerstone, I expected more from you this morning, no, this afternoon. Because the preacher just told us this morning that something happens when you open your mouth. You see, when you open your mouth, not just you get blessed, but the person beside you get blessed. Here we find he goes to Samaria and opens his mouth. And when he did, the people started to listen. And when they started to listen, they started to also watch the things that he did. They listened to what he said. And they watched what he did. They listened to what he said. And they watched what he did. Where the deacons at? They listened to what he said. And then they watched what he did. One of the things that kills ministry is when what we say doesn't line up with what we do. That's right. That's right. So if you gotta smoke your cigarette, get in your stinking car and do it down the street. You got because they listened to what he said. And they watched what he did. They saw the miracles that he performed. And look at what happened through Deacon Philip. Unclean spirits. Oh Jesus came out of many that were possessed. Many who had palsies were healed. The lame who couldn't move got up and started walking. Not because the apostles did it, but because the deacon started preaching and performing miracles. Look at the text closely. It said many, not all. And the only time the scripture says all were healed is when Jesus did it. But in this case it says many heard and watched 
and all of a sudden became converted because they saw unclean spirits coming out of folk and they saw people who had palsies healed and people who were lame healed. Deacons, how wonderful it would be if the pastor could mount the pulpit and not have to deal with the devils in the pew because you handled it all right. If you dealt with the demons before the preacher mounts the pulpit, because you have the power and the authority to say, Get thee behind me, see. How wonderful it be, we don't need special prayer. If we wouldn't need special prayer no more. Because before the preacher gets into the sanctuary, healing has already taken place. We can move prayer from getting people healed to getting people to another level in God. This is where the text makes it clear that there was joy in that city. This is crucial for the 21st century deacon. And if there was ever a time where we needed to shift back to the original purpose, the original power and plan of God is now. The model of deacons being administrators over the business of the church while the spiritual needs go unmet is unproductive. Yes, I'm aware there's business aspects to the church. Yes, I'm aware we need every we need all hands on deck. I'm aware that we need smart men and women who can come to the table and figure out how to do this thing. But it doesn't make sense for the church to be fiscally healthy and have all its bills paid and be spiritually dead. Because then it ceases to be a church and it's nothing more than an organization. And I don't know about you, but what I go through from Monday through Saturday, I don't need to come to no organization. I need to come to an organism that is alive and well in the Holy Ghost. Isn't it amazing that Philip went to Samaria while running for his own life? And he didn't whine about it. He didn't murmur about it. He wasn't crying when he got there. He didn't complain about his circumstances. He went down there, I can imagine singing Sister Dudley's old song, This May Be My Last Time. Maybe the last time. I don't know. He, he, he met going down there and said, listen, listen, listen. I may die in the process of doing this for God because my life is in jeopardy. But when he got to the city and saw that they didn't have Jesus, he said, well, while I'm here, I might as well do what I've been called and consecrated and ordained to do. So he was able to reach down and impact the lives of others Amen. until there was joy in that city. That's what I believe God is calling those who serve in this role to do today. Not just Deacon McFadden, but every deacon in this church. You're being called to create an atmosphere of joy by the way you carry yourself during both good times and bad times. So you can't be a good deacon only when things are going well. You got to also be a good deacon when you don't have money in your pocket. You got to be a good deacon when hellhounds are on your track. You got to be a good deacon when it doesn't seem like things are going to work out well for you. Because I need you to understand that when you do what God called you to do, the power inside of you creates joy in the city. Many of you may be asking, well, Pastor Wilson, how did he do this? And how were the first century deacons able to produce so much power with so much on the line? Shouldn't be too hard. Because although we look wonderful this afternoon, everybody in here got something on the line. The enemy ain't friends with none of us. And your trouble may not be as heavy as your neighbor's trouble. But you best believe you got some trouble that's staring you in the face. Because you see, today, deacons have to face the reality that there is a, there's a lot on the line and there's not a lot of time. We don't have time to be taking a bunch of votes. We don't have time for motions and seconds. And we don't have time to be calling a meeting just to schedule another meeting in order to talk about what we did in the last meeting to try to decide what we're going to do about the hungry. No, brother, you can reach in your pocket, go buy some groceries and feed somebody. We don't have time to sit around a gathering on Monday night in order to schedule a meeting for Friday night in order to go talk to the pastor on Sunday morning because when you get to him, you shouldn't come with a problem. You ought to come with a solution. Ministries all 
of America are struggling. Pastors are dying, retiring, and some are outright quitting this thing. They're saying, that's enough. I had enough of this. People want to have a lot to say, but not a lot to pay. Deacons often find themselves standing between the pulpit and the pew, trying to make sense of the spiritual attack against the church. And you don't know whether to listen to the pastor or listen to the people. You ought to listen to God. So while we can sit in the 21st century and take joy of what happened in the 1st century, the question still remains, how do we become effective again? What must deacons do today to shift the focus of ministry back to God's call? Let me try to help you with that. I'm going to give you these five points and then we're going to close. First thing you got to understand, it's not about... It's, it's about service, not status. See, the role of the deacon is not about being seen. It's not about sitting up front. It's not about having a big ring of keys on your hip. It's not about walking around telling people you can't sit there and you can't chew gum and you know you can't come over here. No, turn them lights off. Don't touch the air conditioner. That, that, that's, not, that's not what being a deacon is all about. Yes, you have to manage the church. Yes, you have to manage its assets. Yes, you have to pre prevent its liabilities. But being a deacon is about being concerned and being on top of the spiritual health of the church. And it's not about your status. It's about your service. And you got a lot to say when you're here, but what time do you get here? If you're the last one here and the first one to go, we can't use you. We need deacons who can show up before the sun come up and pray over the house before anybody even get here. We need deacons who understand that there's a work that has to be done. I'm here to serve, not stand in the front with my chest poked out. Not service, not status. We got to understand that not only is it about service and not status, it's about the sacred and not the secular. I've seen some deacons dressed to the nines, from head to toe, car shining, hair fried, dyed, and laid to the side. Got the pinky diamond on, and Sunday best. And you ask them to read a scripture. And they thumbing through the Bible like all of a sudden they just gonna get this this new revelation of what's in me. Help us, Lord. Help us, help us. We are caretakers of the mysteries of the gospel and the sacred text ought to be familiar with you. It is not about how well you look or how fine you live or how large you live in. It's about do you know Jesus and can you tell somebody else about him? Then you got to remember, you've been set aside to meet a need, not to separate and divide the people. The job of the deacon isn't to foster or rally people to be on their side. So that when something don't go their way, they can get their folk to vote it down. <laughs> Trying to have a separate church inside the church. Where the deacon is the leader. That's not your job. Your job is to meet the needs of the people. And there are folk in the sanctuary who are hungry. Folks who can't pay their bills. Folk who are lost. People who can't raise their kids. People who, whose marriages are in trouble. There are people who don't know what to do tomorrow, none less today. And they need somebody with a spiritual with a spiritual connection to the Lord Jesus who can help them through this process. Because everybody can't get to the pastor. That's why they said, if you handle all these things, we can stick to the word. Amen. How do we get this back? It's about sharing the gospel and not sharing gossip. There's no deacon should be running around spreading gossip. No deacon should open his mouth talking about he said, she said. What did the Lord say? 
You ought not let anybody tear down other leaders of the church. You ought not let anybody come against your pastor. You ought not let anybody just open their mouth and say anything against your first lady. No, when they're in your presence, it's about Jesus or you're going to have to take that conversation somewhere else. You have got to be about the sacred things of God and not about the foolish things of the world. You cannot spend more time in gossip than you do in the gospel. It's about the Savior and not yourself. And if you're going to serve strongly as a deacon, if we're going to have the same kind of impact they had in the first century church, we have to understand that self has to be denied in order for God to be glorified. Stephen denied himself so much that he became stoned. Philip left, his, left everything he owned in Jerusalem. And ran to Samaria because he was not selfish. He was concerned about the Savior. Amen. And if he could spread the message that we have a Savior, he could help other folks find their way to Christ. If we follow these simple principles, select the right men for this. If we just select the right people, men who are well respected, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom, not drunkards, not greedy, and not dishonest. Men who have an understanding of the gospel, tested, not guilty of scandal. If we can then, if we can just select the right people for this, we can be on the move of seeing power restored to the office of the deacon. And if we get the right people, then we can expect the evangelistic results. We can expect the word of God to begin to increase because the pastor will be free to preach and teach the gospel and the number of disciples will be multiplied because we'll move from having church folk to having disciples. Because yeah, yeah. you, you do know there's a difference between having church folk and having disciples. Yeah, yeah. Church folk are people who come to church, but disciples are people who follow Christ. And too many of our churches today are filled with church folk. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They know church protocol. They know when to stand. They know when to clap. They know how to walk down the aisle with their finger up. They know when to do this and when to do that. But when you ask them to do something for God, they ain't got a bit of power. You ask them to pray, they can't pray. I I don't like to pray in public, but you like talking gossip in public. I don't like to sing loud, no, but you like to talk loud. I don't want to be in the front. No, you want to be in the back so you can dog everybody in the front. That's church folk, but we need some Christian folk to fill the church who are disciples and followers of Christ. And when we get some deacons with some power, they can convert the church folk to disciples. You got to, when this happens, then, then you can expect a fresh anointing Amen. that will empower you. Yes, You'll be able to come to church now yeah. and start driving out demons. Yeah. Matter of fact, you want it to be so that when you show up, yeah. demons start saying, uh-oh, I thought they was visiting today. They start calling each other on their cell phones, so-and-so, they here today. Find another church. Are you laughing? But look at somebody say, "That's the kind of power I want." See, I don't just want to be a member that show up and ain't got no power or authority. Now watch this. I'm not talking about power and authority over the people. That's right. That's right. I'm talking about that's spiritual right. power. Yes. I'm talking about yes. the kind of power where you can lay hands on the sick right. and they start to recover. Yes. I'm talking about the kind of power where you can come in and a person whose head is dropped down in sorrow will find hope just in your good morning alone. Yes. Anybody here want that kind of power? Tell somebody I need a fresh anointing. Yes. I expect God to anoint not just ordain Deacon McFadden, but I expect God to anoint him so that when he shows up, unclean spirits will be driven out. When he shows up, he can usher those with palsies into the presence of God and they can find their place among those who said, I was sick, but I'm now healed. And those who are lame will be healed. That's when you'll see what Philip saw. That's when you'll see the lame walking and the blind seeing and the lost found and the sick healed and the trouble finding release. There'll be joy in the congregation. Joy in your house. Joy in the community. Joy among the people. There'll be joy in heaven. 
heaven and there'll be joy in the sanctuary. And look at somebody and tell them that we need some joy in this place. And so I dare you to high five somebody and tell them, let's connect the power. I'll get my power and connect it to your power. And anything that don't belong in here, we're going to drive it out of here. Because I didn't come to church to be cute. I didn't come to church to see who was here. I came for a revival. I came for my cup would overflow. And if you don't have the power, I'm going to share what I have so that you can start walking again. Well, I'm going to take my seat. But I come to tell you, this is more than an ordination. Nah, uh-uh. This is more than just an ordination. It's an elevation. We come to tell the devil that everything you did to hold this man back, every attack on his life, every attack on his family, every mistake he ever made, all of his shortcomings, you thought you were going to hold it against him. You thought God would punish him. But what the devil doesn't understand is that God can't be fooled by anything the devil says about you and I. Because when you have a relationship with him, you can mess up and the devil can tell God on you. And all God's going to say is, I already know everything they did. But in order to fool you, I let them go through it. So you thought you had the victory, devil, but you didn't have it. Because guess what? I'm about to elevate him. Before the mighty hand of God In due season He'll raise you up Yeah Tell somebody neighbor We're witnessing a due season We came more For more than an ordination We came for an elevation We came for a notification What are we here to notify? We're here to notify That God still sits high And he still we're here to put the devil on notice that no weapon formed against me shall be able to prosper. We came to put evil on notice. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. We come to put the world on notice. We come to say the Lord is my around. You ought not be sitting around 
Come on, we just gonna have prayer and go home. Pull out your sermon. Tell them I'm not the pastor, but in the spirit of sin. Let me tell you about Jesus. I know you're saying, well, I'm not a theologian. You don't have to be. Get you a scripture. It could be a simple scripture. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. And then start to tell him how you know that. Start to tell him I got a roof over my head. But the Lord is my shepherd. I got food on my table. But the Lord is my shepherd. I got health in my body. But the Lord is my shepherd. I got a loving family. But the Lord is my shepherd. Tell him Jesus lived. He died. And he's coming back. Amen. Somebody who's nosy. Yeah. Say, what, what, what did Philip tell him? The Bible doesn't say specifically what Philip said. But I believe he told those people, don't worry about the racism between our people. Jesus paid all that off. I believe he told them one Thursday night. An arrest was made. They thought they arrested the Savior. But the Savior was arrested in sin. He was tried before a kangaroo court. And on Friday, he was taken before Pilate. On Friday afternoon, they put an old rugged cross on him. And marched our Jesus through the dusty streets of Jerusalem. And when he made it just outside the city limits, they hung him high and they stretched him wide. And he hung there until he covered all of our sins. Then he hung his head and he died. But three days later, he rose again with all power in his hand. And I believe Philip said that same power is in Samaria right now. That same power is in your heart right now. And if you confess with your mouth and believe with your heart, that same power will save you from your sin. Power move words into action. And the people got delivered. And the Bible says there was great joy in that city. Deacon McFadden, that's going, I believe that's going to be your testimony. That when you let the Lord use you, there'll be great joy in the city. Can we give God some praise? <laughs> Thank you. 